Hello, and welcome to Can't Unread, the podcast about the texts and ideas that change us. And today we're talking about philosopher John Searle's Chinese Room Thought Experiment and the impact that it's had on my field, philosophy of mind. We'll talk about the relationship between minds and machines and what each can teach us about the other. We'll examine the relationship between texts and their authors and ask what the best way is to endorse an important idea without endorsing the character of the person behind it, which can be harder than one might expect. Today's readings include an article by writer and law student Claire Neufeld called Me Too and John Searle a Year Later, as well as the pretty extensively detailed Scholarpedia entry curated by John Searle on his Chinese Room argument. On cantonread.com, you can find a number of related readings if you'd like to learn more. Okay, let's get started. But first, a word from our sponsor, me. Do you like thinking about hard things? Do you not like thinking about hard things but feel compelled to do so because the world is a mess right now? Do you want to talk about things that matter to you with someone who cares? You should see a therapist. And you should be on this show. If you'd like to discuss an article or a piece of short fiction and the ideas behind it with yours truly, go to cantonread.com and fill out the form at the top. If I think you'd be a good fit, we'll pick something to read and discuss together. I'd love to work with you. And this, if you've ever had a philosophy course, this is known as the famous mind-body problem. I think that has a simple solution, too. I'm going to give it to you. And here it is. All of our conscious states, without exception, are caused by lower-level neurobiological processes in the brain, and they are realized in the brain as higher-level or system features. It's about as mysterious as the liquidity of water, right? The liquidity is not an extra juice squirted out by the H2O molecules. It's a condition that the system is in. And just as the, as the jar full of water can go from liquid to solid, depending on the behavior of the molecules, so your brain can go from a state of being conscious to a state of being unconscious, depending on the behavior of the molecules. The tr famous mind-body problem is that simple. That's John Searle on consciousness. Simply put, to be conscious is to feel things. You know this already. It's the difference between my Roomba hitting a wall and rolling backwards, and me recoiling in conjunction with the weirdly agonizing pain of stubbing my toe. Both the Roomba and I are systems navigating our environments, but in the case of us colliding wholly or partly with the solid physical fixtures in our lives, I've had a feeling, but the Roomba has not. This seems simple enough to most of us, but in the study of the mind, the topic of conscious experience is often referred to as the hard problem because we're so far undecided on the right way to study it. Leading thought on consciousness is currently an uneasy cooperation slash competition between philosophy, psychology, neurobiology, and computer science. These categories are very loosely equivalent to general theory of mind, external observation of the mind and of behavior, internal and minute observation of the brain and its associated systems, and technological recreation or simulation of the mind. You can theorize what constitutes a mind as opposed to a brain, etc. You can observe a person using their ostensible mind in the real world to see how it works. You can to some extent, directly observe that person's brain from a chemical and or neurobiological standpoint, and you could build something that seems to have mind-like qualities. This is the most ambitious multi-science and philosophy crossover episode in history, except for maybe the making of the atomic bomb. 
and this Gordian knot of disciplines has consciousness at its core, along with the more general and related question of what it means for something to be a mind. What makes consciousness so freaking weird? For one, the origin of consciousness, as well as its function in the mind, are pretty obscure. We have identified some parts of the brain that might be consciousness prerequisites in humans. Recent research at Harvard suggests that in people who are awake and aware, two specific areas of the cortex, the outer part of the brain, form a network of activity along with the brainstem, while those in vegetative states don't exhibit this activity. While this is great progress, studying consciousness in the brain continues to pose some unique challenges. For example, I can be pretty sure that another person is conscious if they're awake, but I'm not sure if a rabbit is conscious just because it shares some behavioral features with me, like appearing to be easily frightened, or because its brain has some structures that are maybe involved in my own awareness. That's why this type of research is difficult, though not impossible. We don't have quite enough information, either from internally observable or externally observable aspects of consciousness, to make definitive claims about consciousness in the same way that we can make claims about things like motor function or sensory reactivity. For context, we've been um, electrically stimulating the motor cortices of dead things to get them to move their limbs since the 1800s. But it's way harder to study, biologically speaking, how my conscious desire to perform an action results in that action, or even if that conscious awareness of what I want has any bearing on my actions at all. What's more, you can imagine an animal that we might consider to be less self-aware than a human still exhibiting electrical activity in the brain before they act that appears to signal a sort of intention, but you could hardly claim that because of this, the creature is aware of what they want like we are, or at least like we sometimes are. Of course, the key observational difficulty with conscious experience is that we can't directly feel someone else's feelings, and those feelings are what consciousness is all about. When I study the mineral composition of a rock, there's not some fundamental inner rockness that I'm missing. But when I'm studying someone's hatred of cilantro, I can look at their horrified cilantro-tasting face and at all the neural activity associated with their disgust, but I'm still missing the part of their experience where cilantro tastes bad to them, which is empirically invalid because cilantro is delicious. Conscious experience is the most subjective thing in the world, and because of this, some people question whether it can be scientifically studied in any meaningful way. That's where the clip I played from Searle's TED Talk comes in. In that clip, Searle is arguing that the phenomenon of consciousness isn't especially different from other properties of things in the world that we take for granted. As he so poetically states when he's using the example of water, quote, The liquidity of water is not an extra juice squirted out by the H2O molecules. It's a condition that the system is in. Emphasis mine. We accept that because of the way our universe works, when molecules are joined together in a more or less loose fashion, the resulting substance is a liquid. We can imagine an alternate universe with different laws where when molecules are loosely joined together, they become pancake mix, and only pancake mix. In which case, if we were still sentient in a world that was by and large pancake mix, we'd be like, yeah, dude, that's just what happens. When molecules are tightly packed together, you get a solid. And when they're loosely connected, you get pancake mix. I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but in our reality, you don't always get pancake mix. If you've got H2O molecules pretty loosely joined together, as in not icy or gaseous, that's water. Insert David Foster Wallace saying this is water here. And water is a liquid. See, I'm teaching you plenty of things you didn't know. 
Searle thinks that if we can accept the liquidity of water as a physical reality, we can accept the consciousness of brain matter as a physical reality, requiring no explanation that's somehow above and beyond the scope of scientific observation. For Searle, when we look at the rough electrical equivalent of a feeling in the brain, and we ask, but why am I feeling this? It's like asking what water is made of, being shown H2O molecules up close, then asking, yes, but what makes it water? What the hell is water? The point isn't that these questions are necessarily unanswerable, depending on what kind of answer would satisfy the person asking. The point is that the consciousness of a mind is unspecial, in the same way that the liquidity of water is unspecial. And that's why for Searle, the hard problem of consciousness is not THE hard problem. It's just one of many things that are confusing but ultimately understandable about our minds. And one of Searle's first steps toward potential understanding is his almost nauseatingly famous Chinese room thought experiment and the thinking behind it. So, some background information. We're almost there, I promise. Around the 1960s, some dudes, most notably Hilary Putnam, began to formally ask whether the mind was like a computer program. The important part of this question is that it's not an analogy. You've got the brain, the hardware, and the mind, the software. Just like with a traditional computer, the software or program, the mind, is abstracted from the hardware, the brain. Note. I'm using software and program kind of interchangeably here. But the difference between them is that a program refers to a specific set of instructions geared toward a certain task, while the term software refers to a broader set of interrelated instructions that form a larger system. So if you think of mindedness as being defined by a single ability or feature, like consciousness, then the mind is more of a program. If you think of it as necessarily being an amalgamation of many features, like memory, motor control, attention, etc., it's more like software. Anyway, I described the mind as being abstracted from the brain. What does abstraction mean in this context? Well, for example, as I am recording this audio into Logic Pro X, and occasionally cringing at the strange timbre of my voice. There's a whole lot going on in the recording process that I know nothing about. Presumably, there's a huge amount of code and hours of signature programmerly frustration behind the fact that I can hit record, speak soothingly, hello, into the microphone, and have my voice appear in vaguely Richter scale-like squiggles on audio track one, which I have renamed ah uh, with a combination of lowercase and uppercase a's. The program, in this specific case, that's being abstracted from layers upon layers of code, sweat, and coffee, is the simplest, highest level of instruction that gives me the ability to click on the record button and have my voice appear on the screen. This is a form of abstraction because the instructions for switching between the recording state and the non-recording state are provided within that program, yet require layers of instruction underneath for this toggling between states to be carried out. People who believe that the mind is computational believe that phenomena like consciousness are the product of programs that are abstracted from the hardware of the brain, from the most basic inputs to layers and layers of instruction that inform each other upwards, just like logic prose toggling between recording and non-recording states is abstracted from code courtesy of software engineers trying not to kill themselves out of frustration. Side note. Abstraction comes in a variety of forms. For example, 
people like to reduce the broad concept of intelligence to pattern recognition, which is a type of abstraction. When you identify a pattern in an image, you're isolating a set of specific related details from a broad field of data. Sort of like a high-level program appears to be functionally isolated from the code beneath it. When you identify a pattern in an image, for example, you're isolating a set of specific related details from a broad field of data. So, if the computationalists are to be believed, I am an abstraction, a mind, designed to perform abstractions to recognize patterns. I am a self-generated cubist painting, painting another cubist painting. Isn't it weird to be alive? <coughs> that sneeze didn't mean anything, I just had to sneeze. The Chinese room thought experiment does not necessarily refute the idea that a mind is a computer program, but it is a criticism of the idea that any program that seems mind-like, e.g. one that could pass the Turing test, is really a mind. The thought experiment is as follows. This is from Searle's Scholarpedia entry on the Chinese Room Thought Experiment. <clears throat> Imagine a native speaker of English, me for example, who understands no Chinese. Imagine that I am locked in a room with boxes of Chinese symbols, the database, together with a book of instructions in English for manipulating the symbols, the program. Imagine that people outside the room send in small batches of Chinese symbols questions, and these form the input. All I know is that I am receiving sets of symbols which to me are meaningless. Imagine that I follow the program which instructs me how to manipulate the symbols. Imagine that the programmers who design the program are so good at writing the program, and I get so good at manipulating the Chinese symbols that I am able to give correct answers to the questions, the output. The program makes it possible for me, in the room, to pass the Turing test for understanding Chinese. But all the same, I do not understand a single word of Chinese. The point of the argument is that if I do not understand Chinese on the basis of implementing the appropriate program for understanding Chinese, then neither does any digital computer, solely on that basis, because the computer, qua computer, has nothing that I do not have. Okay, let's unpack this thing. In this thought experiment, Searle's responses to questions in Chinese are no different than those of a native Chinese speaker. Because he's following a set of really specific rules, the program, he knows to respond to a certain set of symbols with another set of symbols, and has become good enough at this that he appears to be able to communicate in Chinese just as well as someone who actually understands Chinese. But here's the catch. Searle doesn't understand Chinese. The program, the book of instructions for manipulating the symbols, does not result in an understanding of Chinese, even though it does result in a set of outputs that are indistinguishable from the responses one would give if they did understand Chinese. As Searle puts it, the program has the syntax down, the manipulation of symbols, but not the semantics, the understanding that comes with having a mind. As Searle writes, quote, it is obvious in the thought experiment that the man has all the syntax necessary to answer questions in Chinese, but he still does not understand a word of Chinese. So, Searle believes that a purely syntactical program, one that entails symbol manipulation like the booklet in the Chinese room, cannot account for the understanding part of our cognition. And it's very difficult to imagine a program that is somehow exempt from this rule, 
as all computer programs are abstractions from, at the lowest level, the processing of ones and zeros. For Searle, a mind cannot be a computer program alone. There must be something going on, not at the program level, but loosely speaking at the hardware or brain matter level, that imbues the more formal functions of the mind with the extra juice of understanding. Artificial intelligence, at least as it was understood at the time of Searle's writing, can't replicate a mind, only simulate one. Because what makes the difference between a mind and a machine is at the hardware level, not the program level. No matter how detailed the manual in the Chinese room is, the man in the room will never understand Chinese. There are a number of responses to this argument that you can read about in the Scholarpedia article, but I'd like to stop here with just a few of the questions Searle leaves us with if what he says is true. The first one is, if consciousness is a property of brain matter, like liquidity is a property of water, is there a minimum amount of brain stuff necessary for consciousness? And if not, well, what would it mean to say this cluster of cells is conscious? Surely it is no sort of awareness that we could imagine. Another question I have is whether, according to Searle, brains process information syntactically at all. When I'm figuring out some math problem, e.g. trying to remember what 3 plus 4 is again, I have a semantic understanding of what I'm doing that a computer does not. But does this mean that my awareness, say, of what the number 3 actually signifies is implicit in my calculations in some way, making the process as a whole functionally more than syntactic? Or is this kind of awareness, as William Huxley puts it, the steam whistle of the engine of my brain, with no effect on my other mental processes? What if my consciousness, the very core of my being, is inconsequential? Anyway, I invite you to think of problems with Searle's argument, but for now I'd like to turn to some other problems. Given that Searle's argument is fairly important in philosophy of mind, you might be surprised to hear that we don't read him at my school anymore. Here's some quotes. Quote number one. His rotating stable of young female assistants were known around campus as Searle's girls. Quote number two. Once, for example, while teaching the concept of visual attention, Searle said he liked to let his eyes wander around the room and settle on attractive young women. Quote number three. He invited her skiing in Tahoe and said he had taken an undergraduate female research assistant there before. He rubbed her foot with his under the table, she wrote, and when it was time for dessert, Searle insisted she share his plate. These are some of the less nasty things Searle allegedly did during his professorship at UC Berkeley. Now, these are quotes from a BuzzFeed News article, and if that fact makes you question their legitimacy a little bit, I do not entirely not sympathize with you. That said, the claims in this pretty meticulous report are supported by many claims from former students and colleagues, most notably Joanna Ong, who sued Searle for sexual harassment, assault and battery, retaliation, and wrongful termination. She reported that she received a 50% pay cut after speaking up about having been groped and harassed by Searle. Hooray, philosophy. Last year, Searle was fired for, quote, sexual harassment and retaliation, according to an official statement from UC Berkeley. The first time Joanna Ong spoke up about Searle was in 2004. Searle did some god-awful things. What's more, the evidence points to Searle having continued to do god-awful things for many years 
past the point where he should have had his professorship revoked and been sitting alone at his kitchen table, struggling to finish a mediocre bagel, feeling nauseated by his own remorse, and finally getting into ethics like a real man. I don't know how you can spend your life grappling with the fundamental questions of our time and still turn out to be an asshat, but it's sure been done a lot. It's like that one parable where the astronomer falls into the well, but in this case, the sky is theory of mind and some other stuff, and the well is being a bad person. I am of the probably pretty typical opinion that it's not worth it to stop reading an essential piece because its author is or was an asshat, as you can probably tell by the fact that we read Searle for this episode. Not everyone agrees that Searle is essential, and I'm on board with the idea of substituting readings that do the same work as Minds, Brains, and Programs, the original paper that the Chinese Room Experiment is from. I think the real quandary is when a work is considered essential, and plenty of people believe that Searle falls into that category. Law student and Berkeley graduate Claire Neufeld makes an interesting argument in favor of a Searle hiatus. This is from the article Me Too and John Searle a year later. Quote, The fact of the matter is, the reason why Searle was so untouchable, and why he was able to get away with his behavior for decades, even though people in the department were well aware of it, was because he was a genius. He knew that he would be celebrated regardless of those actions, and in fact, he was celebrated for them for years. His legacy as a brilliant mind would live on and remain untainted by any allegations that came out against him. I think there are a couple things to consider here. The first is that I think Neufeld makes a compelling point that I and maybe you might be trying to ignore, which is that by disseminating Searle's texts, we are, by and large, assigning value to him as a person. Maybe not us as individuals, depending on how you feel about him, but we as a society value certain intellectual feats, and sometimes I wonder if our collective value system is complex enough to hold contradictory metrics of goodness. On the surface, it seems that what should matter are the ideas and not the author. But the value of ideas and the value of the author are intrinsically linked. After all, when we think of people we consider geniuses who did bad things, unless they're truly universally hated, they're first and foremost geniuses, and only secondarily are they people who did bad things. So I think we have to ask the very difficult question of whether or not, socially, we value a shitty genius more than a normal, good person. From Neufeld's point of view, refusing to read Searle is a radical attempt to claim that we value character over great ideas, that we're willing to choose one type of social progress over another. By refusing to read Searle, we either argue that letting his behavior go undenounced is worse than if we were to lose his ideas, or, more radically, we allow ourselves to take an ideological hit, so to speak, in order to denounce his actions. People like to use the idea of the death of the author to try to argue that the value of the author and the value of their ideas are not inherently linked. But this is actually an active misuse of the term death of the author. The death of the author is about the interpretation of the text not the value of the author themselves. It suggests that what the audience perceives a text to mean is more important than what the author says that it means or intended for it to mean. Regardless of whose interpretation is most powerful, there's clearly some kind of relationship between the social half-life of an idea and the perceived social value of its author. What Neufeld rightly points to is that we can't expect the value of a text and the value of an author to be automatically separated, nor should that, morally speaking, always be the case. What I think Neufeld gets wrong, though I'm sympathetic to her position, 
is that a sorrel hiatus is the most effective way to try and alter the metrics we use to assign value to ideas and their creators. By arguing that the best way to call out Searle is to stop reading him, we're actually reinforcing that value relationship between authors and their texts. We're saying that if we're not reading Searle, clearly he's not as important as people think he is or as he thinks he is. It could reaffirm the same one-dimensional metric that if people have a valuable idea that's being disseminated, they're a valuable person, and if they don't, they're not. At least in my opinion, maximally rewarding genius as opposed to rewarding being a generally good person is part of why our species is trash. It's part of why the progress we make is fraught with disasters. Certainly, I think that intellectual feats often do constitute progress, but that we can make better progress if we adjusted our metrics a little. It's too often that really good ideas result in huge amounts of damage. But I don't think that refusing to read Searle, for example, is a good way to adjust these norms. And like I said, I think that this refusal might even covertly reinforce them. Another point where I sympathize with Neufeld but disagree with her is where she claims that Searle got away with all of this because he was a genius. Since I don't have the misfortune of knowing Searle personally, I may just be wrong here, as every case of human shittiness is different. But I'd assume that genius is not actually the most important factor here, because incredibly stupid people get away with incredibly shitty actions all the time. Searle got away with this because he was in a position of power, and you can come by power in lots of ways, sometimes through genius, sometimes through money, sometimes by being an ontologically mediocre white man. For Searle, it was probably a combination of these things. Genius doesn't constitute social power unless it comes in the right package. And while I don't doubt that Searle is plenty smart, I'm sure some of his power is what allowed his intelligence and his eccentricities to flourish maybe for better, and also definitely for worse. In some of his more recent work, Searle argues that socially established rules, which he calls status functions, quote, tend to work best when people are unaware that they are there at all. We perpetuate them by doing what we know, often without thinking about it. A dollar bill is legal tender for all debts, public and private, because this was institutionally established and we uphold this function of bills by paying for stuff with them, which is pretty useful. Thanks, social world. I think that awareness, and not a refusal to engage, is what can gradually change the value relationships between ideas and their authors slash creators. Because the ultimate goal isn't to share fewer ideas but to approach the values surrounding them differently and maybe more critically. And I hope I've given you an example of this here. Thanks for listening. Next week, we'll be reading Indifference is a Power, an article by Larry Wallace about stoicism and its contemporary applications, as well as its amusing misapplications. Join us next time. 